Previously on your Geek Fix, we upgraded the Wand Company's Pip-Boy 2000 kit using a modified BlackBerry Passport to get a working screen and to play Fallout in other games and media. We also used the Wand Company's Upgrade Module to get this working radio that's interrupted by broadcasts from the Fallout universe. But not everything worked, it still wasn't a fully functional Pip-Boy yet. There were still some things that needed to be upgraded that we didn't have. There's no working Geiger counter, no clock, not even a working holotape. But who knows, maybe it's hidden somewhere in the settings. Hey, I don't look happy. Ah! Yeah, we should really do something about that. So in today's episode, with a little help from some of our friends, we're gonna find ways to make fully functional Geiger counter, clock, and even a holotape that can interact with up to three devices. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of your Geek Fix. Well, it's been about two years and our Pip-Boy is still running strong. And in that time, many of you were inspired to make your own upgrades with improvements upon what we did. For example, Roger Bossy, or Esso Breger online, figured out a way to keep his Blackberry intact. It even sounds awesome. He also modified the holotape area to cover the bottom and made his own custom hood to access the power button. This also means he still has access to the Blackberry keyboard. I haven't figured out a way to do that with my own. Meanwhile, Vince from Massive DMG figured out a way to rotate the Pip-Boy app and his screen as well. Since then, he's created a moving Geiger counter needle and a digital clock. And best of all, he's working on a way to make it wirelessly charge on a stand. Two videos later, others of you still had questions about how exactly I took apart the BlackBerry or, or how I installed it into the Pip-Boy. The truth is, if I was to do it again, I wouldn't do it the same way. I mean, you remember in the first video, I took it completely apart. And that was because I didn't know how exactly to uh, make this work. I was trying to figure that out still at that point in time. And I can tell you that if I was to go back, I would do things very differently. First off, I didn't spend hundreds of dollars on BlackBerry phones. Truth is, these were mostly 50 to $60. And the last two I got as a two for one. So, not hard. And the reason for that is that I didn't need something that was fully functioning. So, broken screen or some other things that might be broken, in the end aren't going to impact this project. Now as far as taking it apart, uh, I still don't recommend doing this project, but uh, as I said in the first video, we do stupid things so you don't have to. So I'll show you how I did it. Some versions of the BlackBerry might require a penelope screwdriver in order to be able to open it up, but generally you don't need a fancy toolkit to be able to take this apart. You can even get away with using these included screwdrivers to be able to do that. First I remove the plastic backing and remove the SD card and the SIM cards. Next, we unscrew the top mount, and then we remove the backing, which you might notice gives us the capability for wirelessly charging, so I had to hold on to this uh, in case you're looking at doing something with that. I removed the plastic covering to access the keyboard screws, followed by the speakers, and then I unclip the keyboard to remove it from the phone. That brings us to this metal bezel that's at the bottom of the screen. It's not hard to cut that off and remove it. I also retained part of the metal bezel and part of the plastic to be able to create a cover for my USB. And that's really where I should have stopped. You didn't need to remove the screen or, or the battery or anything else from it. I'll leave it in place as a protector and then I'm just going to unclip this clip right here, popping it off and uh, then getting my new screen, which are really inexpensive by the way, but there's two types to get. There's this one that has a cover and then there's this one that doesn't have a cover and because it doesn't have a cover that means that I can also have more play with this ribbon which once when I connect these I can then twist into place but at the same time this is going to be hard to fit into that front screen area and that's because it's not completely flat and so to do that what I did was uh, pushed the screen back just a little bit at the top and then I put in some of this black foam around the edge to kind of fill in that space. This way on the inside it's completely flat and you'll find that your screen fits much better. One of the benefits also of having the screen separate from the rest of the body a little bit is that I can move this portion backward a little bit and so that means that it doesn't have to all fit flush against the front and that's important because as you can see I have the USB sticking up through the cuff and the only way you're going to be able to do that is if that back of the phone is slightly tilted backward. Now to make it stick out the side 
without any other major modification, I took this back plate, hit it with a heat gun until I could kind of flatten it out just a little bit. And what you'll find is that then it fits perfectly through this little area right here. Then I just slid it through the cuff itself and now I'm able to charge it and it's pretty discreet. I mean, it sticks out a little bit, yes, but it, you can't really notice it. I also had some successes that I didn't go much into or, or ever tell you about. For example, I found a way to not have to take apart the thing to take out the batteries or switch out the batteries in the radio by connecting USB AAA dummies to a small power pack that I can just keep in the cuff. I also had some things that kind of worked like this switch on the side. People made comments about not being able to toggle because the phone was over here, but I figured that there was an easy way to do it. As I showed in the last video, this phone has a magnetic sensor and I remembered Google Cardboard and how it used a magnet to be able to act as a button for the phone. So I made a version of the Pip-Boy interface in Flash before they disabled it and wouldn't allow you to use buttons anymore. And then I used the BlackBerry sensor as an input device for the buttons. Each time the EMF was within a certain range, it would act as a button click. And that worked for a few days. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's because that isn't really a static uh, measurement. It, it might be changing because of other electromagnetic information around it. Uh, it could even be this bar right here is becoming magnetized. I'm not really sure, uh, but within a few days I started to see it be more sporadic. It was either constantly clicking or not clicking at all. I'm sure that there's somebody out there that could decompile that APK so it would use those sensors as an input, but I decided to take out the magnet because it wasn't working and I have plans for the Geiger counter area. Like, for a Geiger counter. But before we can go any farther, first we gotta go back to the beginning. It was, that was a, an enormous challenge. It really was. Meet Chris Bernardo, director and co-founder of the Wand Company who was personally involved in making the Pip-Boy kit. All of it. I do the illustrations, I write the copy, yeah. He even had a big influence on the Pip-Boy in the game. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in the Pip-Boy itself, the, the original mechanism for the holotape uh, opening, um, obviously a designer had, had thought, oh, if you just pull it down, something will happen. But when I actually looked at the mechanism, I thought, there's no way that if you moved that, anything would happen at all. So I, I sort of redesigned the mechanism for the holotape and said, this is how we're going to do it. They said, we can put that back in the game. That's what you get if an engineer designs something. And then I designed a stand for it. And I thought, well, the stand should look like an arm and then maybe it could have a hole with the speaker and it could have this base and a few pipes and things like that. And as, as we got to build the kit, it became clear that making the stand was too expensive. So the stand died at, at, at that stage when we were making the kit because I wanted the box and I wanted, you know, the box was a very expensive part of the proposition, and, but I wanted the whole thing to be a presentation. And then when we went to E3, when, when they announced it, I sat in that massive auditorium. There was, a, there was they built a one-time thing, like in a big tent on top of a car park. I had, it must have cost 10, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, whatever it cost. There were banks of, you know, thousands of people watching this enormous screen, Todd doing his speech. They revealed the trailer of the game. And right at the beginning, the guy leans forward and takes the bit more of a stand. I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> So that's I mean, yeah, I think we got it from like one of the reference shots and I was just like, well, this is the thing that it's supposed to be on, so go ahead and use this. <laughs> and I went to the guys after us and said, uh, you used my stand. And he said, oh yeah, we should credit you. He said, you know what, we thought we thought we had done the design and given you the graphics of it, and then you had made your design from it. So I said, no, it didn't exist at all. So they said, well, it just looked really in universe. So that was really cool. And then later, the actual Pip-Boy kit itself, the actual box, everything in the game as a quest. So really excited to see that. And that's what I want our products to be. I want them to be right in that space between the real and the fantasy. In fact, their company's mission is to make fantasy into reality, which is a lot easier said than done. I mean, when you think about it, the fantasy world doesn't have to obey all the same rules and laws that the real world does, and so that makes things like even size and shape difficult to determine. I mean, how exact could this be? That is a one-to-one -one accurate thing. And then, of course, the actual thing in the game, 
what's one to one some when you go up close to some of the things on the table that, like the the holotapes they're bigger but when you when you hold them in your hand they're smaller yeah because one size works really well for that first person animation of sliding it in there another one works really well for it sitting on the table and anyone realizing it's actually there without going like the gamey way too because you know a lot of games will just be like make it sparkle like the little flashing and stuff like that in those games where everything flashes your brain kind of like shuts off at least for me you're just like pick up the shiny thing versus like what's on this table and you actually ah, find stuff and pay attention and that's part of why people appreciate the clutter and stuff like that and this raises another problem with reality in games like fallout which is that we're really talking about more than one reality sure it's a 3d game but at the same time that game is actually made up of three different realities that are rendered in layers you have the environment the pit boy and then your data so while the environment's three-dimensional, what we see in front is really our two-dimensional perspective, which allows game makers to make things look like they're gonna work much better than they actually do. For example, in the Fallout world, this CRT is a perfect fit for this Pip-Boy, but in the real world, not so much. So that's why you can take your gun then in these games where it renders this way and just go right up against the wall and it looks fine. It's like, well, that gun is like six feet long shotgun thing. Like, shouldn't it be sticking in there? Because then you have so many other problems to solve. Like, oh, but then it needs to like pull up like this if you're close to the wall. So it's sort of deciding which thing is more important. And for some games, it is being able to like reach out and grab things in the environment. But for the Bethesda games, I would say that scope is the most important thing. And we don't have time to solve the things like that. So it's an easier way to have it as just a separate render pass. So with the manuals and various things, I wanted them to be on the edge of that fantasy reality. So they actually feel real, but they also are in this fantasy world so that you can, as a user, you can tread between the two. If you can get that and you can get that in every bit of the product you do, owning is believing. That is the whole point of where you have this thing where they fans want it to be really real and work like a real thing, but they also want it to be really accurate to the prop. I am, I love the props, but I'm just not a prop. I, I wouldn't be a prop collector. I would just as happily have a replica if it was accurate. They make good work. They make good stuff over there. I mean, it really, that is an impressive kit. Meet professional collector Dan Lanigan. Dan's the owner of such coveted props as the Indiana Jones Fertility Idol, Egon Spengler's Proton Pack, and of course the original Decker's Pistol from Blade Runner. I dug uh, your uh, your Pip Boy video, and uh, you know it's like, hey, I just literally a week before built my own version of that same piece. So uh, you caught me at the right time. The fact is, the one company has become well known not only for making accurate screen and game props, but props that work in ways similar to the fantasy world. Wands that make things magically happen, communicators that can make phone calls, pokeballs that come to life as they sense your hand getting closer, and even right now they're in the process of making a working tricorder with sensors that measure the environment. So why didn't Pip-Boy do anything? Why did they release the working parts separately? Why are these screwdrivers so small? And whatever happened to the rad meter? These questions are all part of a little known story of the difficult journey it took to get that prop made and to get it out into the hands of the consumers. A story best told by Chris himself. Here, here's a story, and it's kind of how it really is, is we had originally been asked to do the Pip-Boy for the previous, for Fallout, for that, the, 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 the plastic kit and the fully working one. And when we looked at the fully working one, and we had a, those often those games, they often think about it late in the day, and then you've got a few months to put something together. We knew at the time, I, I think we were working on the one of the Sonics or the Communicator. There was no way we could do, our small team, we could do a proper job on it and do the sort of job we would want to do on the pit. That was the previous one. And anyway, they did really well. And they sold hundreds of K of units and it was brilliant. And we missed, in a way, we missed out on it because my kid, the one who loves Fallout, had said to me ages before, you should do a pit boy, it'd be really cool. And we said, wow, pit boy, very complicated, lots of plastic. Then they came to us and said, we're doing a new version of the game. It's, it's the perfect storm of product. It's going to be so big. It's this, that and the other. Can you do a fully working pit boy? Now, at that point, we were working on another project and it was like taking up all our time electronics wise. And I knew that if we committed to doing the electronic version of the Pip-Boy, we would miss the delivery date 
uh, miss the launch. And if we missed the launch, we would fail. And we would probably, actually, as a small company, we'd probably go bust. So I, I said to the, the guy who's the licensing guy at Bethesda, could we have a toy license to make the toy version? And then can we just put the electronics version to one side and do it later? And he said, yeah, uh, yeah, great. I then said, well, if I'm going to make a toy, there's no way I'm going to make like a 50 buck toy of Pip-Boy because the previous one, you could put your phone in it. Phones have all changed now. That sort of thing's really difficult to do. And, and, and also Bethesda hated doing the app. It was complicated. It, it caused problems. They, when they get towards the end of a project, they're in crunch time. They're all working 24 seven anyway. They don't want to be working on an app for you. And if there's no, app, there's no product, it's, it's a fail. So you have to base in, build in all of those things. So I thought, well, I'll make a kit. I mean, I loved Airfix kits when I was a kid. Those those kind of construction kits we build them all the time. And I and I really I built hundreds of them and I loved it. And I was thinking when I started doing it that actually later we would make a fully functioning one. And then as we went on with it, I realized that if we made a fully functioning one, we could be doing that for three or four years. We would never finish it. Whereas if we made a series of modules, I know that we could make one in a in a in a you know in six months we could make a module. And that may, that would mean if we had a radio, at least the lights would light up and, a, and at least the radio would work. And then if we had a light, just a light behind the display would be good. A light, a screen with a light in it. Every single project you take on gets more complicated. As you found with the BlackBerry thing, it's prone to failure. It's more complicated than you thought. It costs more than you thought. Somebody wrote, somebody wrote, and I just got to get this off my chest, right? Somebody wrote, who designed this manual? They were so lazy. Right. Okay, I was working 18 hour days. I was drawing it. I was negotiating with the Americans. I was negotiating with the Chinese. I was flying 70 days, flying back and forth from country to country in 10 months from a standing start to that product, including the manual. And yeah, I'd like to have made it better, but I can tell you for certain I was not lazy. <laughs> the biggest mistake I made was, and it's a hilarious one, is those screwdrivers. Well, I, I designed these screwdrivers and I thought, genuinely thought they would be a bit bigger <laughs> and it was right at the end of the project and you know i just didn't have a 3d print made of them i 3d printed everything else when we assembled the first one i just said there's no way these screwdrivers work the screws are tight and the screwdrivers are too small now in the stand this is the correct size for the screwdriver and this one is is two-ended and this was the size i was imagining in my head was the size of the screwdriver and in fact in this thing it's really nice as it, it fits in a space underneath the so you can store it with the toy license in place they can now begin designing and making the kit with its equally collectible box parodied from a 1940s uranium prospecting kit for kids oh yeah i know that kid that is exactly my reference for it. Yeah, you look at the front, look at the handle. It's cool, and it's beautiful design. That's what's great about it. Wish the game wasn't so buggy, but hey. They also began designing and making the modules, like a screen that lights up and flickers until you hit it, and a radio that gets interrupted by announcements from the Fallout universe. Mentally, I was driving to work each day, and I was designing it in my head in the car. The radio mechanism, where you turn the knob and the thing goes down. I was trying to think, I, I do think a lot about the things and think, well, how would it have been done in the past? How do I get motion from that way to this way? How do you, how, is it cogs, is it levers? Because I mean, in the real old fashioned radios, they had cords that went round little pulleys and stuff. And as you turn the knob, a cord went round and it, and it dragged the pointer up and down whilst it was doing something else. Now in the radio upgrade, that mechanism still works. But it's so cool. The, the pin from the, the, the knob goes through the PCB. There's a hole in the PCB. And on the other side, it's got two magnets and a, ho a hall effect sensor. So as you turn it, it goes past the hall effect sensor. And as the sensor senses the magnet going past, it switches the program to play the in-universe broadcast. And it have a bit of hiss over the broadcast either end. So it sounds like it's just like breaking into the radio. But in fact, that, that turning of the knob is just like almost like a switch saying, by the way, you're turning the knob now. The radio was a significant challenge. Those, those boxes at the end are really weird shape. They were hard to mold. They are only exactly big enough to fit two AAA, three AAA batteries. They, you can't fit, they're just the length. So when you, when you take the radio out, you'll see that one of the contacts at one end for the batteries is the actual PCB. There isn't any space to put contacts in there. 
that 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 made significant challenges radio right how hard can that be you need an antenna and the antenna needs to be a multiple or a fraction of the wavelength of the ra uh, and the wavelengths are in meters right so uh, and normally you have an antenna as a great big aerial and you know when you take your fm radio and you take the aerial off all you get is <laughs> what well, doesn't magically pick up the signals it needs that antenna that curly wire isn't really long enough and actually in parts of the uk especially in my office for example and where the the software uh, guy lived no signal i mean in america you have kind of big radio stations all over the place but in the uk you can be somewhere where the signal's really low and in my office i couldn't get any stations at all i just said well this is useless it's not even a product it doesn't work they said yeah when I, when I took it and showed it in america straight away it just went to like loads of stations so I thought, that's, that's okay, that's the biggest market, that's fine. Some modules were completed, and they even ended up releasing the stand with Bluetooth capabilities. Eventually, the kit, stand, and modules were even showcased at E3, where you saw the video of Norman Chan from Tested interviewing Chris Bernardo. I'd already ordered my kit and was pretty excited about the idea of it working, but I was admittedly disappointed that it wasn't going to be a working device. Originally, they did want to make a fully functional display, one that looked like a CRT and that would actually interact with the game. Problem was, the screens these days are too wide and that making a special screen that would meet that traditional shape would be too expensive and because they're only planning on making a few thousand of these, quote, fans would not be able to afford it. Other people also said that there wasn't enough room behind this screen to be able to make it into some type of working device. So I took this as a challenge. Finding an affordable screen that would fit the classic square shape with the Pip-Boy interface built in, self-contained, and able to interact with Fallout 4, and hopefully future-proof. And I actually found the solution fairly quickly. This is the BlackBerry Passport. I'd already printed a scale picture of the motherboard, so I knew that it would fit, but I didn't know anything beyond that. I mean, I did the whole thing blind, on camera and that resulted in a lot of frustration and trial and error mostly error so i took a blackberry and then you go so i took a blackberry i just thought so, that bit really got me out that was so cool so three wasted phones to get one working product um why mm. people that make movies generally make movies because they love movies People that make props for movies and for that fans. I mean, you're not making, you're, you're building your pit boy because, you know, it's a prestigious thing to do. I mean, maybe you might do something because it's cool, but, but ultimately it's because you love it, right? And basically, if you want to do something, doing it is the key. Doing it. Not, not, not talking about it and thinking, why, haven't I, why hasn't anyone done it? Just doing it. You can do it. Any question that you have, there's going to be an answer out there for it at some point. Like, you just have to go and find it. So it's tough, but it's a lot of fun. And just like anything, I mean, if you can wait it out long enough, you can probably do it right and just learn from your mistakes along the road. And learn we did. I also installed the radio module in the first episode and was anxiously awaiting the release of the radiation meter. It was planned to be released the following year, and I contacted them just before the follow-up video to see if it was still happening. Their response was, we don't have any solid plans or release dates just yet for the sensor add-on. We're hoping for release sometime next year. Sorry, I can't give you much more information at this time. We're super excited for it. But by June of 2020, I contacted them to see if it was still going to happen. And they told me it was basically dead. I was hoping we could influence the release by showing how much interest there was out there. I even asked the one company if it would help if everyone would write in. And that's when Chris first contacted me. Our minimum order quantity is 10,000 units. So unless there are 10,000 people out there who want to buy one tomorrow, and even if one guy or gal writes to us every day for a year, it feels like a lot to us. Every day we get an email, please, 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 can you make a... a but even if you added them all up, over the year, it's still only 360 people. <laughs> it's not It's not 10,000 people. It, I think the rad meter was just too expensive. And, and for a company like ourselves, who has to invest in, in, in the product, we need retailers who are experts at selling stuff to buy it from us. And then they sell it to you guys. And if a retailer says to us, hey, and they used to, there was a company called ThinkGeek. We had a great buyer there and he would say, you know, that's a lovely product. I'll take 10K of those. 
And that underwrites the whole project for us. We can then spend all the money we want making it, knowing that we've got sales of 10,000 units. And we knew he was good for his word. If he said it, he would do it. And so we would then put everything we could into it. Now, what happened with the pit boy sadly, when 76 wasn't as successful as everyone hoped it would be, all the retailers who said, oh, you know, we wanted 15,000 units of that. We don't know, we want five or two. And we were already buying the components and making stuff. And as, as a small company, we can't just absorb that. that. That cost, we can't just make them in the hope that somebody will buy them. And we had already started making the radio and the, 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 the screen, I felt, because that nearly got cancelled, without the screen, the radio's fine, but really you need the screen to light up. Even just a light, light behind it, you just need something. And so I pushed forward with the screen, even though the market wasn't really there for it at the time, the retail market, so that at least fans that had the radio could have the screen. And the rad meter was just a step too far. It's, it's a lot of money, money we didn't have for retailers who didn't really want to buy it. And when there's the odd fan that says, yeah, well, I'd pay. Would you really pay $1,000 for that thing? No, you wouldn't. You want it, you want it. Even $50 is going to be expensive. We've got to, and for $50 in the store, we've got to sell it to the store for $25 because they want to make 25 bucks in it. So it's sad because we have, as you saw at E3, we had an actual working one that's there with a to going up and down. I don't know if that actually sensed anything. And that's the other thing, because if you're going to sell a rad meter, it's got to sense EM radiation. And if you haven't actually worked that part of your design through, but the rest looks good, looks great on video, but of course it doesn't actually work. So it doesn't work, no one's interested in buying it. So there was, there was a catalogue of things there that stopped us, but we went, a lot of work was put into it, about eight months, and we got really close to making it, but just stalled at the last part of making that. Otherwise, the, the thing would have been the whole lot. So with Chris's blessing, our community could begin looking at solutions for making our own working Geiger counter. Which raises the question, what is a Geiger counter anyways? Every day we're surrounded by danger. But some dangers are those that we can't see. of radiation. While not all radiation is dangerous, ionizing radiation is so strong it will rip electrons from atoms and molecules, causing DNA and cells to change to the point that they get, well, not pretty. But how can you measure something you can't see? That's where I come in! Who are you? I'm Rod, the Geiger Mueller tube! And why do they call you Rod? My sister's name's Susan. Are you trying to make something out of it? Anyway, I'm filled with a chemically inactive gas and a charged wire. So normally things are pretty quiet. But when radiation enters my tube, it causes an electric reaction that can be measured on a meter or heard on a speaker. The more radiation, the more reactions and noise telling you to get somewhere safe. See you all later. So that, let's go back to the story of the rad meter because you can make a Geiger counter. It's a metal tube, put a foil on the top, put a sensor at the end, a little thin wire. I was thinking, how hard could that be? It's not that hard, but as many of you recommended, you could just get one of these pre-assembled Geiger counter kits. The biggest problem being the cost because they can go anywhere from 90 to a thousand dollars. However, I got all of these for about 20 to 25 dollars each on Electronic Gold Mine which is a really cool site. It always has interesting things that I'm looking for. The trick is to wait for things to go on sale and to act quickly when they do. For example, I found this one for about $20 one night and I decided to buy two. And then the next day I thought, you know, I really should buy more. And when I went back on, it had already gone up to over $100. Another benefit is that they are exactly the right size, the right width to be able to fit inside of this. But even the smallest one with the battery is a pretty tight fit. But another problem that comes with trying to get small Geiger counters is those tubes are really small. And generally speaking, the smaller the tube, the less sensitive the device is. You could make a small ionizing radiation sensor, but it will pick up radiation when you're near Chernobyl and other places. Or in fact, as Richard found, if you have one of those camping gas mantles, they're radioactive. And we were thinking, could we 
sell it with those mantles? Could we sell it with a radiation source? And thinking, oh no, that sounds like no, that's never gonna happen. The most radiation I was willing to use was one of these small ion chambers that you get from an old smoke detector. And even with the largest tube, the most that I could get was like single random clicks. So nothing that would really impress anybody. If we made a small one, it would be so insensitive that you'd have to be near some disaster to sense anything. And then that would be silly because it wouldn't be fun because you want to hold it up and make it go click. So what the, the idea was that we would use EM radiation, like the thing you showed. And if we had EM radiation, then it would have to have clicks like a Geiger counter. Okay, that's we can we can sort that out. But what we'd also want is the needle. And there's no off-the-shelf needle that's exactly the same size. Now, if you want to make your own one with any old shaped needle, that's fine. But if you want one with the needle that fits that exact thing, then you have to have a custom. And you have to have a custom coil. The, custom, the whole thing has to be custom. And then, yeah, that's fine if you want to buy 100,000 units or you're happy to spend $10 on each one. But if you want it to cost $1 and you only want 10,000 units, don't forget, someone's going to make that product and sell it to you and only sell it for $10,000 and make it and sell you 10,000 of them. I mean, you are talking, you, you imagine stacking that all up. So obviously it's not cheap or easy to mass produce meters. At the same time, you should be able to buy one, right? Or, or to, to make one yourself. Problem is when you type in the word meter, most of what you're gonna get is something like this. And as you can see, most meters run from left to right. And the problem with that is that when I put it into this orientation, uh, it's pointing in the wrong direction. So what I need is a needle that goes from right to left. But where do you find that? Try looking up panel meters, uh, specifically horizontal or vertical. Usually they look like this on the front, but when you look at the top, the needle runs from right to left. Next we need one that's small enough to fit inside of my Geiger counter and also is set for the right measurement. Personally, I like this one, but it's by Jewel Instruments. And it goes from zero to one milliampers. That'll make it a little bit more sensitive. Outside the casing, it's real small and perfect. I even found I could connect it to some of my Geiger counters by bypassing the light. But again, I'm not gonna get very much activity. These are options, these are ways you can go. But what if I just want something that looks like it works? I wanted something that you could easily recreate at a reasonable price. Something that looks like this. Something that turns on, makes the needle move in really organic ways, and then has Geiger counter clicks. And here's how I did it. Now first off, if you've watched any of my videos, you've seen me use these Castar batteries. Now you don't have to use this particular brand, but, but batteries like this that are actually a lithium ion battery and that have a USB charger at the bottom. I'm also planning on using one of these magnetic USB connectors. That way I can connect with the battery and still maintain that aesthetic on the outside. We're also gonna need three soft white lights and two soft white flashers. And finally, this wire connector from Evid Designs. Now originally I wanted to use the buttons that it came with, and to keep those original buttons, the, the best thing I could come up with were buttons like this. This is what they call a momentary switch. This is the type of switch you find on your controllers. It's called the momentary switch because it only closes the circuit as long as you're pushing down on it. Once when you lift up, it opens that circuit and there's no power. The only way to make these kind of switches work as an on-off switch is by using additional logic, which would mean using resistors and MOSFETs that uh, would use up more space I don't have. I needed a clickable switch, but again, I needed it to be pretty low profile. And I decided to go with these. They're pretty low profile, they work pretty well, they don't require a lot of pressure. It also came with these little red buttons. Now the only problem is these buttons are a little too red. They're uh, really bright red, but I found by using a little bit of ebony rub and buff, uh, I was able to make that color exactly what I needed it to be. I also made this 3D model, which I'll also include below, which has a spot to hold the light and spaces for the switches. That will allow me to slide these buttons in and click them right into place while also providing the support they need to be able to push on them. And now we're ready to wire it. First I connected my top button to one of the soft white lights and from there to my connector. Don't forget to put a hole in the outside and send the connector cable through before you solder it on the inside. The second button I connected to my two flashers in circuit and from there to my meter. Why did I do this? Well, because those two flashers will act as variable resistors. 
There'll be limiting power in different amounts at different times, which will make that needle look a lot more organic in its movement. Now the bottom button I wanted to use for sound. I wanted to make that Geiger counter sound. And you can get something like this. This is the multi-play uh, pre-recorded sound clip. It's pretty small and you can actually store sounds on it. But it wasn't small enough in my mind. I really liked the speaker on my last project of the uh, Ecto-1 Siren. It had a little itty bitty chip attached to the speaker which produced that siren sound. So I contacted Evan Designs and said, is there any chance that you could make something like that with a smaller speaker and can produce that Geiger counter sound and they said yeah we can do that and they are making one special for our audience that speaker's small enough to fit perfectly inside of what space I have left so now as long as that connector cable completes the circuit I get my lights my Geiger counter bouncing and my sound now you might be wondering why do we have that connector in the back uh, what's that about and the answer is that's for the clock area um, I knew that I needed some power to go there and uh, knew I probably wouldn't have enough room inside to put any type of power. So this is one case where I'm going to break my rule and have one module that feeds off another. But before we can do anything else with this, first thing I need to do is take it apart. Now there is a reason why they included this pre-assembled and that is because if you try to take it apart or put it together without knowing any better there are parts that will shoot out or that will come apart and not go back together very easily so for that reason before you do anything check out the video up above or in the description down below where I'll give step-by-step -step instructions on how to take this apart and put it together without much hassle now when I first assembled the Pip-Boy, all I did was painted some clear acrylic over the numbers so it looked like they were windowed. But what I really wanted was something that looked more like it did in the game, uh, like there's actual rulers in there. And if I could, I wanted to be able to make it work, I mean actually be an actual clock. And yes, I did consider LCD screens. For example, I found that some of the Fitbits were an exact size and flatness that I would need to fit inside that windowed area. And the best part is that they have a free SDK development kit and instructables to show you how to create your own apps to make it look like the actual rollers and to sync with my phone. The only problem is that when it's turned off, it would just be a black screen. I mean, there would be no numbers, no nothing. And I wanted something that even when it was turned off would look like it did in the game. And I thought about clock making. Uh, I've never made clocks or watches, but I know how they basically work. I mean, you've got a, a mechanism with a motor inside, and then you have three gears that turn three different size posts at different speeds, and that's how you get your seconds and your minutes and your hours. And I thought to myself, well, surely I could make one that's hours, 10 minutes, and, and minutes, then I could just extend the posts, put in supports, and put my rollers with numbers on those. And that would work great. Uh, the only problem is, I've never made a clock or watch. And again, we're talking about something that is so small, it would have to fit on the fingernail of my pinky. So, what am I going to do? What I needed was something that already worked that way. Something with rollers in it, the watch, that uh, was something like uh, this. This is what they call a drum roller watch. The coolest feature of which is that it does this when you press the demo button. And when we take it apart, as you can see, on the inside, I've got these tiny rollers that are just the right size for my windows. And when we take a really close look at them, as you can see, they have these teeny, tiny little gears. And the whole mechanism not only fits on the nail of my pinky, but was the perfect width for that clock area. So it seemed like it was, should be able to work. The only trick was, this is the brains for that clock, and uh, this is what told it when to turn. So rather than it constantly turning like most clocks do, this would only turn to the next number when it was that time. In fact, if you look at some of the rollers, they have more numbers that would make sense. This roller that's for the 10 minute slot still goes all the way up to uh, nine. So my guess is that it spins past that when it gets near the end of the time. Also, this is my source of power. Using the power from the back of my Pip-Boy, I was able to connect to these mechanisms, but first I ran it through tiny pot switches and uh, connected those switches to other switches so I could titrate down that power uh, to where it would turn, but not turn too fast. And this is where everything started going sideways. Uh, one of the rollers burnt out, but I could only fit two rollers next to each other anyways. And of course the minute roller was only big enough for 12 minutes. 
So I had to create a sticker with five minute increments, but I couldn't seem to slow it down with the power. When I went down low enough, it just stopped what? turning. When I put the top on, it caused friction on the rollers, and that meant that it no, no, would no, no, stop no. turning. And next thing on. I knew, those became burnt out. And, and basically, I gave up. You know, clock making seems like it'd be easy. You know, it's just gears. No, no. But it's so, no. it's, we that's looked, where I, looked I've got stuff. We looked at it. We were going to put an LCD in there. We yeah. looked at it. Um, for a start, the design doesn't fit the rollers. The other thing is that those odometers meters, they count round. Yeah. They're actually not very simple at all. They're very complicated. Yeah. Loads of gears, that's expensive. They can all go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh it's a rat's nest. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I gave up on it. That was, so I didn't want so, anyone to even know I did it. It wasn't worth it. <laughs> so I knew people would bog me about it. There's a few things we've talked about that that's how I feel about those. Yeah. You go, you go 90% of the way there and you realize that that last 10% is the difference between it being a product and it yeah. not being a product. And yeah. It's too late then to back up. Yeah. It's just so sad when you get to that stage, you just think this would be so nice and, and the yeah. people out there would love it. So I gave up clock making and decided, you know, if anything, I want to make something that's gonna look cool. Something that will turn on and off, have an effect to it, that will still look like there's rollers in there, and that anyone out there could make very easily and, and at a cheap price. Now the first thing I needed was a version of this plate that had holes in it. So I made a 3D model, which I'll make available in the description below. And then I got a couple of polystyrene tubes, one of them that is 7 16th inch and the other that's a half inch. I kept both tubes to the width of that window area. Then I cut out my rollers with the date and time using some black vinyl, which I'll also include the design for. Then I wrapped that vinyl around my 7 16 inch tube. Then I cut my half inch tube in half so that I could fit my 7 16 tube inside. And then I put those inside my clock area. Now be aware, you will have to cut out some posts of the top and the bottom of the clock area in order to be able to make that fit. Next, I took two soft white lights and placed one inside of my red button, and then I put the other just inside the tube. Then I attached those to my connector wires, uh, which will eventually connect to the back of my Pip-Boy. Now one of the mistakes I made was I thought I could fit the wires uh, through this area right here. This is where one of the buttons needs to be able to slide, and even though I cut down into it and put them at the very bottom, it still made it so that it would get stuck. So instead, I cut along this side area, and put the wires down in the bottom where it won't get in the way of my mechanism. Once all that was done, I reassembled that holotape area, plugged those wires into the connector for the Geiger counter, and now when I push that top button, it lights up like this. And it looks beautiful. And with the way I put it together, it still works brilliantly. And that brings us to the holotape. You know, to be honest with you, initially I was not planning on doing anything with the actual holotape. I was happy with things the way that they were. However, a lot of you commented that you wanted me to do something with it. And also, yeah, there was a lot of comments in relation to NFC tags, for example. Which isn't a bad idea. I mean, there is a way to use that NFC type of technology. Unfortunately, it has to come pretty close to the phone to be able to share that identifier. Personally, I was thinking about another type of NFC technology, which is where two phones can connect uh, just by touching, can share information. But again, they actually have to come pretty much in contact. And uh, the holotape wouldn't be that close to the phone. Um, we're talking about at least a half an inch of distance in between. Plus it would be limited. It would be limited to, to what's on there. Sure, I could take out different holotapes and it would recognize different things. So I, I started thinking about what exactly is it that I associate the holotape with as far as technology goes. And I remember back to when I was a kid, I'm old enough to have had a Commodore 64, which used audio tapes for being able to transfer information. I mean, like actual audio tapes. Computer could write to those audio tapes, it could be stored on the audio tapes, but it could also read them. Um, and in this case, I need to do a sort of a pseudo version of that. So some way to be able to store or transfer information back and forth between the holotape and the Pip-Boy. But at the same time, we'd have to do it wirelessly somehow. Also, I want to keep this self-contained. So that means that I also need it to be self-powered. So basically, I needed some type of hard drive or data storage, a Wi-Fi router, and power. And uh, I have to fit it all inside that credit card size space. So how was I going to do that? 
Well, for quite some time now, there has been SD cards, kind of like this one, uh, which are adapters for micro SD cards and at the same time have Wi Fi, um, their own personal Wi Fi. Now, this is the one that I really like. I like it because it does a few things. One, it doesn't have to be put into a camera. That's what they're made for. Is so you could put them into your camera and they'd be able to wirelessly transmit to your computer photos and videos without actually having to take out the SD card. But unfortunately, a lot of them, kind of like this Samsung one I have right here, are specific only to those cameras. Others you have to subscribe to a data service in order to be able to use. Um, this one has a great app that allows you to access it. You can access it also from your computer. It can be accessed by up to three devices at one time and it's indiscriminate. It doesn't care if it's inside of a camera or if it's just inside of some type of USB port. As long as it receives enough power, it will turn on and work. But then came the next problem, uh, power. Unfortunately, SD cards require at least 2.7 to 3.7 volts in order for it to just turn on. Usually about uh, 3.4 volts if uh, we're talking high speed cards, which is a weird Mount now I do have right here a 3.7 volt battery uh, But I still needed a way to be able to control that so I got this Adafruit board which will also allow me to charge the battery and uh, will be able to send power out to my SD card initially I assumed that I would need a breakout board in order to be able to turn on that SD card safely and have it uh, controlled because it'll have a variable rate and uh, so I got one of these boards right here which takes that type of SD card and uh, really I only need these two pins right here to be able to power it so that's what we did we put the SD card into that slot we connected that to the control board we connected that to the power and the only issue was that uh, this uses a lot of property and so even though it did work it wouldn't fit inside that holotape by any means. In fact, I went through and designed and printed my own holotape with super, super thin top and bottom walls. I mean, this is like paper thin. But I thought to myself, I wonder, I wonder if I could directly connect to that SD card. So we tried it out. We soldered those wires directly to the SD card on these pins. From there to the board on these two pins. Connected my battery and it works. And now I've saved enough room where I can actually fit it all within that orange area. For the most part, I did have to modify the holotape a little bit to be able to get it to fit, but it does fit and it does work. And then to designate this holotape from the other ones that I have, I printed this vinyl sticker that I made based on the in-game pitfall tape. So that's actually based on my favorite Atari game. Finally, you might be wondering, well, how exactly did you get it to turn on or turn off? And the answer is this. This is what you call a reed switch, this little tiny thing right here. Uh, on the inside, it has these little tiny wires. And when those two wires come close to a magnetic source, they become attracted to each other and complete that circuit. So I put a little magnet in the back of my holotape area, and then when the holotape comes in contact, I look and you'll see as soon as it turns on uh, that that uh, Wi-Fi choice is available. And then I am able to, from there, go into the application, which you will need to sideload on the BlackBerry, at least I had to. Once we're in there, we're allowed to browse. And from there, I get to choose what types of data I'm browsing or looking for. So if I want to open up pictures, you can see the pictures are already pretty viewable. Uh, and then I can select any of those and it'll open them up. Or I can go into my music and select one of those. And it's playing directly from the card right now. So instantly, really, it, it comes across. When I went into my videos, the videos that I've saved at 1080p or raw, I did notice that they were a little bit slow to, to load up, but they did load and also played in real time, sound great. And then another benefit to using this card and this app is that it's not limited to just videos and uh, pictures. It also allows me to access other types of data like APKs and games. And so I also have the uh, Pip-Boy app on here, which I will say, I did notice that downloading from that card, uh, this is a pretty small APK and yet it took an awfully long time to load. And with that, we're done. Uh, 
which is a strange thing because two years and three videos later it's been quite a journey we've learned a lot of things met a lot of new people there's a lot of you out there that say that you can't do this but the honest truth is with a little bit of passion you can turn any idea into a reality you can be inventive you can create so just because I made the upgrades I'm gonna make doesn't mean that there can't be more ideas or things that can be done which raises the question is this really the end Oh, that's perfect. Thanks. Hey, Timmy! Is it done? Well, let's find out, shall we? Yeah, this is gonna look great on me. Hey, but I've also got something for you. I got you the new version, the 3000. And all the kids are gonna want those. Uh, don't forget your canvas bag. Handy, ready the door. You know, Timmy, there's something I've been meaning to tell you. You're my father. What? Well, not exactly my father, but you're a synth. Huh? And surely you noticed. I mean, you woke up in a lab. It's your birthday. You're wandering around with no family. The real Timmy's been dead for years. Not to mention the fact that you've gone from being like 10 to 16 in two years. I mean, how do you explain that? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just you and me now. Me and my dad traveling the country. And with these things in place, what could possibly go wrong? Well, that's not good. Thanks for watching. Please be sure to like, subscribe, comment below. Also be sure to check out the full interviews and visit our contributors in the description below. And be sure to stay tuned for more of your Geek Fix.